Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, a very good morning to you all. And uh, uh, I want in a special way to welcome you to our eighth workshop and uh, uh, in the PhD seminar series in business management. Uh, and uh, the topic that we are still handling is uh, navigating the PhD terrain, but uh, with much emphasis uh, on literature review. So in this uh, workshop, which is workshop eight, we shall be focusing our efforts uh, on literature review. And before we go uh, deep into our workshop, uh, I'll tell you uh, the various components that will constitute uh, the structure of our workshop today. So I will be telling you what literature review is. I'll take you to some tips about conducting the literature and uh, I'll take you to writing a literature review and then from there we shall go to constructing the literature and of course problematizing the literature and writing your literature review, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, our lecture today certainly uh, supplements the workshop that we held earlier on. This is workshop eight because in workshop seven we dealt with constructing a theorized storyline, if you recall. And in that particular workshop, we did uh, present a challenge how a researcher, how a PhD student can actually combine literature and field insights, and it can be challenging. Now, in the same workshop, we did go through pertinent issues that led to crafting a theorized storyline. And we said that, that in crafting a theorized storyline, you must, for instance, A, provide the study significance. And of course, the significance can be provided if you understand field insights. In other words, you've got evidence, you've got context and evidence, and you go to the second level of situating your study, right, uh, so that it can uh, contribute to knowledge, right? So situate your study. In other words, to create space for your study to contribute, ladies and gentlemen. From there, we move to the third move, right? Uh, where we said that you must be able to problematize literature, right? Uh, so that your literature is able to contribute, right? And of course, there we said you can do that very well by, uh, of course, using certain rhetorical moves that uh, I did demonstrate. But of course, first of all, you begin by constructing literature because you must construct, and this must appear in your background, right, of the study or introduction of the study, right? So you can use either synthesized coherence or progressive coherence or non-coherence. And then from there, you go ahead and you problematize literature, right? And of course, you can problematize literature uh, using a variety of ways, ladies and gentlemen, that we did go through. You can say literature is not finished yet. It's actually incomplete. But you can also you say it is incommensurate, right? And you can use such terminologies uh, right from time to time. And then from there, we said that for a shadow, uh, to, in order to demonstrate uh, how this study contributes to the problematization that you would have achieved and uh, move number three, ladies and gentlemen. So from there you can see that all the things we are talking about led to literature. And that's why it is important for us to go into the literature review, ladies and gentlemen. So that's why I've told you in this lecture, right, I'll take you through what literature is. I'll give you some tips uh, about conducting literature, and of course writing literature, constructing the literature, problematizing the literature, and uh, uh, eventually writing your own literature, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see, whenever we talk about literature, right, and we talk about literature review, 
Literature review is a review of the writings. It's a review of literature on a particular subject or topic. I know that most of us have topics by now. We have subjects. So you must go to the journal articles, right? You must look for books that have written about the concepts or the constructs that you are studying. It's a review of the most relevant, a review of the most recent and scholarly work in the subject or topic area. We say that because when you go to the library, you find a lot that has been written. Right, but then in your case, you must pick the most relevant, you must pick the most recent and scholarly work on the subject. And of course, when we talk about literature, we refer to a piece of writing that supports, a piece of writing that evaluates, a piece of writing that critiques your research topic, ladies and gentlemen. So when you go uh, and you start looking for journal articles to review, do not only look for biased information, or biased journals that say nice things about your topic. Right, look for journal articles that supports, journal articles that evaluates, and journal articles that critiques your research topic, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to say that literature review is one of the most, most, most important early steps in a research project. And of course, uh, uh, this literature review is one of the most humbling experiences you are likely to have, ladies and gentlemen, when you start thinking about your PhD. Uh, it's the most humbling experience simply because you are likely to find out that just about any worthwhile idea you will have, uh, uh, you will have has been uh, thought of before, at least to some degree. Even if it has not been worked on in your particular area, or researched on in your particular area, look for related uh, disciplines. You'll discover that a lot of work has been done in that area. So when you are reviewing literature, there are certain things that we look out for, right? Uh, and we can always distinguish a good literature from bad literature, or what we call poor literature review. So good literature review, certainly, ladies and gentlemen, is a synthesis of available research, right? But a poor literature is an annotated biography, or bibliography, ladies and gentlemen. So when you read, you can't even understand what the fellow is talking about. Now, of course, a good literature review is a critical evaluation. A good literature review has appropriate breadth and depth. A good literature review has clarity and is concise. A good literature review uses rigorous and consistent methods. So in other words, when you pick a piece of work and you read through, you will know that this is good literature or bad literature because poor literature is just an annotated uh, bibliography. It is actually confined to description. Uh, it is usually narrow and shallow and uh, confusing and long-winded and constructed in an arbitrary fashion, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I'll tell you, this is where most graduate students fail. This is where most PhD writers fail, right? When you read literature review, it's as if they copped slabs of material from one place to another place, and there is no consistency of thought in what they are talking about. It's more or less like having, uh, and this is very common in Africa here, uh, where you have uh, a child being born, uh, a young girl, right? And uh, of course, maybe the family is very poor and they cannot afford uh, clothes or buying clothes. So they will go to the auntie. The auntie, maybe when the auntie was uh, uh, making her skirt, there's a piece that remained, uh, which was red. Then you go to the, another uh, judge, in this case, or grandmother, who has another one which is green. And then you go to another uh, auntie, uh, that uh, had a piece that remained that is yellow, and another one that is really green and blue and uh, so forth. So when you bring up those things together, you start now. Uh, of course, you take everything to the tailor, and the tailor puts together the dress, and then you'll have a dress for the 
young child. Now you see greed, red, blue, it is it's very confusing. So most of your literature review is very confusing because you pick slabs, slabs of information and you pick it there. You forget that the person who constructed that literature and problematized that literature had an argument that he himself was advancing. And your argument is totally different from his argument. So you cannot simply pick sentences. You cannot pick paragraphs and start putting those paragraphs together. Now, if you do that, then you have a poor literature review that is actually confined to description, narrow and shallow, confusing and long-winded, and then consistence of thought will not be there, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, you see that, um, as I've already told you, that uh, literature review is one of the most humbling exercises. And if you are going to develop a theorized storyline, you pick from literature. So you are going to, and by the way, when you look at your dissertation, your dissertation, right, has a very huge percentage of literature review, right? Just look at the background, the introduction section, whether it's introduction or background, whatever, the, the terminology that you use at your university. If it's introduction, you have a lot of literature review Certainly, which is combined with the field experiences, and that's why you must co uh, have a context, right? And then you'll have even theories there. That is still literature review anyway, ladies and gentlemen. So you'll go through uh, the things that we talked about, constructing a theorized storyline, significance is there, right? Uh, situating the study in literature to create space to contribute, right? Those elements are there. That is still literature, by the way. Problematizing literature it is still there, by the way. Then you have all those aspects of foreshadowing uh, your, uh, your study, your problematization uh, to demonstrate the importance and the value of your research. Uh, within that particular research program. So you see that is literature. Introduction section is literature. Now again from there, you go to the literature review itself. There is still literature. If you go to the methodology, you'll find some bit of literature. So you'll find that the only section that you pick from out is a small component that is under the findings. But even the findings, you'll have a discussion of findings. And the theoretical implications, still you have to bring in literature again. So literature review is very important, and I think time allowing, we shall have more workshops uh, on this concept of, of literature review. So literature review is designed to identify related research. Literature review uh, is uh, designed to set the current research project within a conceptual and theoretical uh, context. And when looked at it, uh, when looked at this way, ladies and gentlemen, there is almost no topic that is so new or unique that we can't locate relevant and informative related research literature, ladies and gentlemen. So let me give you some tips about conducting the literature review. First, concentrate your efforts on scientific literature. Try to determine what uh, the most credible research journals are in your topical area and start with those. If you're working on entrepreneurship, what are the most credible journals in entrepreneurship? If you're working in the area of behavioral finance, what are those most credible journals in behavioral finance? Of course, you, this is very important because not everything that appears on the internet is useful. There's a lot of rubbish on the internet. There are lots of predatory journals on the internet, right? Now, and uh, you'll even find things that do not constitute knowledge, right? Where an individual writes today, the following day the paper is published because the fellow has paid some little money, right? So you need to look for credible journals, ladies and gentlemen, and start with those credible journals in your area and put great emphasis on research journals that use a blind review system. Because in a blind review system, Authors submit uh, potential articles to a journal editor uh, who solicits several reviewers who agree to give a critical review of the paper. Now, of course, the paper is usually sent to these reviewers with no identification of the author so that the, re so that the reads or there will be no personal bias, either for or against the author in this perspective. So blind reviews, ladies and gentlemen, are based on the reviewer's recommendations. The editor can accept the article or reject it, 
uh, recommend the author to revise and resubmit the paper. Articles in journals with brand review processes can be expected to have a fairly high level of credibility. So those are the ones that you should start with. Then second, right, ladies and gentlemen, do the review early in the research process. When you join your doctoral program and you start working on particular concepts, etc., you need to start reviewing literature early enough. Learn how to read books that constitute or contain theories. And when you do that, you are likely to learn a lot in the literature review that will help you in making the trade-offs you need to face, ladies and gentlemen. After all, previous researchers also had to face trade-off decisions, ladies and gentlemen. So you are not alone in this. There are so many people who have been there before you. So what should you look for uh, in the literature review, ladies and gentlemen? First, you must, um, uh, well, what should, you, what, what should you look for? First, you might be able to find a study that is quite similar to the one you are thinking of doing. Uh, and of course, that is very important since all credible research studies have to review the literature themselves. You can check their literature review to get a quick start on your own. So it's very important for you to find a study that is quite similar to yours, right? And of course, if you really discover that there's a study with the same topic, right, like the one that you are thinking about doing, think twice, right? Unless you are really going to overthrow the reigning paradigms or you are going to construct your literature and problematize uh, the previous studies in terms of having produced results that are wrong and misleading. Because if you can achieve that, say yes, this is what they studied, but their studies were wrong or misleading and misguided in some way, it is, then you can go ahead and pick the same topic. But if there is nothing to challenge and demonstrate that contribution to knowledge, then do not pick a topic. Do not simply copy topics from the various journal articles or even from the references that are given, ladies and gentlemen. So this is very important. Now, the second thing you can do, uh, of course, prior research will help assure that you include all the major relevant constructs in your study. So that's why you must look at journal articles, because they have covered constructs already. So unless the situation you are studying is unique and you are going to construct or come up with your own concepts, right? Then, of course, especially if you're going to use grounded theory, that is very possible, right? But if you are using constructs that are already known, these constructs have been studied, they have been measured, right? And, of course, debates about these constructs exist, right? And then uh, start with literature review so that you get to know how much there is. So you may find that other similar studies routinely look at an outcome that you might not have included in your study. And yet, that particular outcome can actually change the entire perspective right, of your work, ladies and gentlemen. So it's very important for you to do that. And finally, the literature review will help you to anticipate common problems in your research context. The literature review will also expose you to the measurement items or instruments right, that the researchers have used. And you can also use uh, common experiences of other researchers to avoid common traps and pitfalls, ladies and gentlemen, in your studies. So that's why you must do literature review. And uh, of course, uh, 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 literature review will give you those particular constructs so that if you don't actually include them, you would not be judged credible uh, because you know that particular uh, construct. All researchers will say your study is not actually credible. And of course, uh, a, a, a literature review will play a significant role in shaping your methodology, ladies and gentlemen. So let's go to the next step, that is writing a literature review. Right. How do we write a literature review? Writing a literature review, ladies and gentlemen, is an active exercise. It is a critical exercise. It is a constructive exercise. It forms an important part of mobilizing your central thesis, ladies and gentlemen. 
And of course, you need to understand that for you to be able to write a literature review. So let me give you guidelines on how you are going to uh, write your literature review because it is a constructive exercise. It's a critical exercise and so forth. So you need to summarize, analyze, and organize your readings. As you are reading the journal articles, summarize, analyze those particular readings, and uh, of course come up with um, some kind of uh, uh, organization of information in a table that will help you remember those things. It is important that you make notes as you read. You should think about and uh, include uh, a number of things like uh, what are the main points or the theories or key issues raised in the text right or the book that you are reading this is very important because you get to understand the theories that previous scholars have used in articulating this issue and what they have missed out you'll be able to see the paradigms that these scholars have used and what they have left out so write right make note what the main points that the authors are making the theories that they have used the key issues which are raised in the text and uh, of course uh, that is very important Two, try to summarize the main points that the writer is making three take details of any quotes and I want to dis discourage you from uh, quoting but once in a while you may need a quote ladies and gentlemen so take details of quotes uh, in terms of page references that you think may be good to use in your literature review ladies and gentlemen make sure you keep track of all your bibliographic information for example, author date, title of the book, publisher, journal, page numbers, etc. Because if you wait uh, to first construct your literature and then produce the, uh, uh, the, the, the section for references, you'll find it, uh, you, you actually, it will be a nightmare to you. You'll find difficulties doing that. So you need also to note the way the author has used the original material uh, that is in the journal article if you have copy the author's words directly, make sure you place them in quotation marks and cite the page numbers as well. So I think I'll take you through uh, another workshop where we shall look at referencing. If you are going to use the APA style of referencing, that's American Psychological Association, the Harvard style of referencing, MLA, Chicago uh, referencing styles, ETC, ETC. So again, there are other things that you need to pick from the uh, journal articles that you are going to read. Uh, what is the author stated or implied purpose? That is very important. So while you are summarizing and analyzing, find out the conclusions that the author has made. What points support those particular conclusions? And of course, at this material time, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say it is useful to write down your own thoughts right on or about the readings that you are making these are useful when you revisit the notes and or use them in your writings ladies and gentlemen so use your summaries and notes to identify relationships and links in the research literature and if you recall I said you problematize literature or you construct literature you can't construct literature without knowing whether uh, you are dealing with the synthesized right coherence as a mode of constructing literature or what we call the progressive coherence or the uh, what we call non-coherence, ladies and gentlemen. So you should also be able to identify similarities and differences between various authors and their research, and uh, what research agrees and what research disag disagrees, and uh, what major questions remain unanswered, and uh, the uh, possible directions for future research, ladies and gentlemen. So all these are very important. So, of course, in organizing your summaries, uh, if you are going to organize your summaries, uh, of course, after doing what I've just told you to do, right, as you are reading, you are making notes, uh, you are doing this and the other, after you've done that and you have those ideas in your table, right, start thinking about organizing your summaries. And to organize your research, cluster similar research together. Uh, in terms of, for example, what information is similar and what information is different. And a useful technique uh, for doing this is to draw a mind map and organize the research into major points under each theme. 
And on the screen here, let me show you how a mind, uh, a mind map looks. Remember, I've said that uh, you cluster those ideas that are similar together, and those which seem to be different, they are also clustered together. And then you can also demonstrate uh, a relationship between those particular aspects. So as you are seeing the mind map here on the screen, ladies and gentlemen, these mind maps are a visual map to link and organize key concepts of your research. I'm sure you, have, you can see what uh, I present on the screen here. They also show links and relationships between ideas. And uh, sometimes it is a good idea to number key ideas in the order that you are going to place them in your literature review, ladies and gentlemen. So this is what you have, uh, again, the mind map that you have been seeing here. In the middle, you've got the topic, then the key points in the corner there. In other words, you are clustering uh, information that is similar together. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to now go to an important aspect, uh, again, that we saw under uh, crafting a theorized storyline, and that is really constructing literature. As I've already said, literature review actively constructs the field of your research. And therefore, you must really pay attention to these things. And there are three ways of constructing literature. One is synthesized coherence. The second one is progressive coherence. And the third one is non-coherence, ladies and gentlemen. We'll start with synthesized coherence. I'm sure you've had these aspects many times. But of course, the more you expose to it, the more you understand it better. Now, under synthesized coherence, this approach brings uh, previously unrelated work together, highlighting points of agreement in order to demonstrate the need for further investigation. In this mode, ladies and gentlemen, the research highlights concepts, uh, methodologies, perspectives, and within apparently disparate fields of research. So research does not seem to be related, or fields of research that don't seem to be related, right, are somehow brought together through what we call synthesized coherence. In other words, if you picked information from physics and maybe molecular biology, and you think it applies to organizational psychology or probably organizational development, uh, or even marketing, you can do so, ladies and gentlemen. So that is what we call synthesized coherence. While on the other hand, progressive coherence depicts the literature in terms of cumulative knowledge growth, consensus of perspectives and methods, and a well-developed and focused line of inquiry, ladies and gentlemen. And the current research uh, is constructed as the next logical step in the collective and growing understanding of the topic, ladies and gentlemen. And lastly, we've got non-coherence. And non-coherence constructs literature uh, in terms of points of uh, disagreement within a research program whose importance is commonly accepted or taken for granted. And this approach emphasizes both the continuous nature of the field, but also highlights competing explanations and disputes, ladies and gentlemen, debates, contradictions in the methodological approaches and findings and the concepts adopted in that particular study. So the research in this case uh, situates itself within a contested field and states its aims in terms of resolving or shedding. Uh, light upon the debate, ladies and gentlemen. So, it's very important for you to understand that, and after you've constructed literature, you problematize your literature, and that's what we went through, and uh, crafting a theorized to a line, and I gave you excerpts and excerpts for you to understand the concept, but of course, you can um, uh, construct literature as incomplete, inadequate, and incommensurate, ladies and gentlemen. So, under incomplete, the literature is portrayed as not finished yet in some specific area. And the research in this case seeks to argument the, uh, the field or even fill a gap rather than question the reigning paradigms in any significant way, ladies and gentlemen. And under inadequate, right, uh, problematization, here the literature is portrayed as excluding alternative perspectives or explanations. And therefore, 
the research aims to contribute by bringing this oversight into view and to introduce different views and frameworks, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, here existing paradigms are not so much questioned, and uh, or maybe uh, yeah, they're not questioned, but maybe they can be extended and improved in this perspective, ladies and gentlemen. And incommensurate in this perspective, when we are problematizing literature, existing literature is portrayed as not simply uh, incomplete, as I said earlier on, but wrong or misguided in some way. So the existing research seeks to overthrow existing views or paradigms in the field and to posit an alternative. So this is very important and this material time is up to you to start now thinking. If I ask a question, how does your own review of the literature problematize and construct the field of your research? And that is a question that you must answer. Before you get out of your PhD program, you must have an answer to that question. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to move to the next aspect uh, in our structure, writing your literature review, right? How, I mean, I've already summarized my literature. How do I write my literature review? So suddenly you have an introduction Right, and I'm also going to show you some excerpts so that you understand how we do that. Right, and I'll read those excerpts and we shall read together. I will show them on the screen and read those particular excerpts so that you understand exactly what you're talking about. So in the introduction, writing your literature review takes time, ladies and gentlemen, and do not forget that. And that's why you must start early uh, working on these things. And literature review uh, doesn't have a specific time to start and uh, end, no. Even after you've collected data from the field, you must go back and revise your literature review section. Right, you must again use current literature to discuss your findings, ladies and gentlemen. So it's quite important uh, for you at this material time, very, very important, that you keep on updating your literature even on the day when you'll be submitting your thesis for examination. And even when it goes for examination, continue reading because on your viva day, somebody will ask you a question. Let me just take an example of what is happening now. Right, for those who did their studies in 2019 or 2016, 17 ETC, and they have submitted their thesis for examination, the examiner may ask a question that you conducted this study before the coronavirus disease pandemic before COVID-19. But now we see that the situation and the terrain has changed with COVID-19. So how then will your results inform policy or practice and even a theorization in view of the fact that the terrain has changed? And those are questions you need to prepare for. Don't simply say, no, I'll not do this, no. Because the panel of examiners may actually ask you to go and incorporate those COVID things. And if I were you now, I would go back and start incorporating those COVID things in the introduction. And then, of course, somewhere you will be able to, to demonstrate uh, through some kind of writing that uh, maybe there is a limitation because there are certain things that you did not include in your work. So writing your literature review section takes time. You may need to complete several drafts before your final copy. And it is important to have a good introduction that clearly tells the reader what the literature will be about. So your literature review section must be introduced. You must have an introduction. An introduction must tell the reader the following things. One, what you are going to cover in the review. You must also tell them the scope of your research and how the review ties in with your own research topic, ladies and gentlemen. Let me show you a sample text, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So just look at the screen here, right? And this is a typical statement that you find in the introduction section of a literature review. <clears throat> so let me read for you. Many theories have been proposed to explain what motivates human behavior. 
Although the literature covers a wide variety of such theories, this review will focus on five major themes which emerge repeatedly throughout literature reviewed. These themes are incorporation of the self-concept into traditional theories of motivation, the influence of rewards on motivation, the increasing importance of internal forces of motivation, autonomy, and self-control as sources of motivation and narcissism as an essential component of motivation. Although the literature presents these themes in a variety of contexts, this paper will primarily focus on, the, on their application to self-motivation. Self or this thesis or this research right, will primarily focus on the application to self-motivation. So you can see, again, using colors, as you can see, orange here is a topic sentence. It identifies five major themes as the scope of the review, right? Although literature covers a wide range of that, that is a topic sentence. Now, of course, you can see here in green, those are the five major themes covered. And then you have concluding sentence in black. Although the literature, and it comes at the end, although the literature presents these themes in a variety of cons or contexts, this paper will primarily focus on the application to self-motivation. So I said I will be showing you many examples, and that's the sample, ladies and gentlemen. And that is a good example of an introduction because it has a topic sentence which indicates what will be covered. I hope you are still seeing that topic sentence. It indicates what will be covered and also tells the reader the specific focus of the literature review in the concluding sentence, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see, right, you need to notice from this, uh, from what you see on the screen there, notice how the student has clearly said what she will cover in this review. And this is particularly important in a large topic area, ladies and gentlemen. So that is one aspect that needs to be thought about in the intro as you're writing the introduction. The second aspect should be in terms of the way you write your paragraphs, right? A paragraph, ladies and gentlemen, is a group of connected sentences that develop a single point. Uh, or argument or idea. And these paragraphs need to link to other paragraphs so that the themes, arguments, or ideas developed are part of a coherent whole rather than separate bits. Now, the paragraph that you're going to develop here uh, should include a main statement or idea that you are putting forward, that is really in terms of the topic sentence. Now, and I'm talking about paragraphs, right? Paragraph must include a main statement, which could also be an idea that you are putting forward. And that will constitute the topic sentence, ladies and gentlemen. You must also present evidence from research to support or argue your idea. And this must really appear in paragraphs, showing where the writers agree or disagree, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, student analysis of the research uh, literature uh, where appropriate is also needed in this paragraph. So every paragraph must have this information. The student analysis of the research literature where appropriate must be provided. And I'm emphasizing that point. And of course, at the end of the day in your paragraphs, you must sum up and link that particular paragraph to the next paragraph. And uh, in the literature review, you will need to show evidence of integrating your readings into each paragraph and analysis of the readings where necessary, ladies and gentlemen. So again, what I'm going to do is to give you examples of these things, right, or samples. So when you are integrating arguments in paragraphs, ladies and gentlemen, 
Uh, of course, integration of multiple sources is important. And then you must also integrate student analysis. So integration of student analysis is important. We want to see how critical and analytical you are as a PhD student. So don't simply copy one sentence here, another sentence from there, then bring them together to form a paragraph. No. Your paragraph must be consistent. Right. And when you are writing, as I've already said, ladies and gentlemen, right, you must provide a main statement in the paragraph. There must be evidence from research to support the idea or the argument you are advancing. Then you must show student analysis. And then you must summarize and link to the next idea, ladies and gentlemen. And then, of course, do not forget to bring in that integration. And as you are integrating arguments in paragraphs, we want to see integration of multiple sources. We want to see integration of student analysis, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, the, the intro, uh, with the integration of multiple sources, to develop an integrated argument from multiple sources, you need to link your arguments together. And uh, what I'm going to do is to actually give you an example here to show how a student did it. Right, so let's just uh, look here uh, on the screen again. You see another example. So let me read for you. Most early theories of motivation were concerned with the need satisfaction. Robinson, Millet, Kachiope, and Waters, 1990, argued that motivation relies on what a person needs and wants. Similarly, the early theories of Maslow and McGregor, ETC, focused on personal need satisfaction as the basis for motivated behavior. However, recent studies outlined by Leonard suggest that personality and disposition play an equally important role in motivation. Current thinking does not discount these theories, but simply builds on them to include a self-concept. So ladies and gentlemen, as you can see from this text on the screen, I hope you are seeing it, and uh, I hope we have read together, right, and uh, you know what is presented. Now, in this text here that you see, certainly you see a topic sentence outlining your main claim or key point. And that's another paragraph, which is more or less similar to the one that we had. Then you see supporting evidence, right? Just look at that arrow up, the blue arrow, supporting evidence, right? We see it here. Then, of course, you see what's written in green. Those are contrasting theories from research. And then concluding sentence linking to the next paragraph. Current thinking does not discount these theories, but simply building on them to include a set of concepts. So you, you, will, accept, you will expect the next paragraph to talk about um, self-concept, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see, integration of student analysis is also very, very important. So students must integrate their analysis into this. So it is important to integrate analysis, right, and interpretation of the literature in your literature review. It's your responsibility. In literature review, it does not mean that you go and pick here and there. And for me, when I read your literature review, I want to see a coherent story that flows, right, again, that is linked to the overall conceptualization of the study and to the background, ladies and gentlemen. So, read again what we are going to do. Uh, I think I'll give you an example here uh, so that I really use less words to describe uh, what I want to describe. I want to show you the integration of the student analysis on the screen here, right? Uh, I've given you an excerpt, right? And that excerpt goes, I'm going to read it for you. By its very nature, motivation requires a degree of individual satisfaction on narcissism. Robbins, uh, ETC, and uh, all those other fellows suggest that motivation has as its very basis the need to focus on and please the self. This, supports, this, is, this is supported by Shaw, Shepard, and Wogman, 2000, who contend that this narcissistic 
drive is based on the human effort to find personal significance in life. It can be argued that the desire to improve one's status uh, is a highly motivated force and is central to the idea of narcissistic motivation. The narcissistic motivation strategies put forward by Sho et al. are concerned with motivation for life in general, but may also have application in the context of work. These strategies with their focus on personal needs demonstrate that narcissism is an essential component of motivation. Now when you look at this text, ladies and gentlemen, that I've shown on the screen, again in orange you see a topic sentence, right? Then, of course, in blue there, you say first statement of evidence from the literature. That's how you present evidence from literature. And of course, when you move to green, you see the second evidence, second statement of evidence from literature. Then, of course, in black, uh, I don't know whether it's black or, it's, I think it's another form of blue there. Uh, uh, you see, uh, I hope you see that very well on the screen, but I think you can see that, especially when you use the arrows, uh, you'll be able to see that very well. Uh, you see a student analysis there, ladies and gentlemen. I think that is green or light green, or if not dark green, right. Now, of course, again, as you can see with the concluding statement, right, these strategies with their focus on personal need demonstrate that narcissism is an essential component of uh, motivation. That is a concluding statement, ladies and gentlemen. So it is very important uh, for you to note that a student needs to integrate her analysis, sorry, her analysis into the write-up. So that's what you have in the introduction. Then from there you can go ahead and write and write and write and write. So analysis is not just student opinion. It needs to be supported by literature, ladies and gentlemen. So we are not interested in your opinions. Later on, after conducting the study, you can do so, but not now. So what I'm going to do uh, right now, ladies and gentlemen, is to take you through some of the verbs that we use uh, when we are writing, right? So to incorporate quotations, for instance, and references into a literature review, you can use a variety of verbs, and these verbs are often used with the prepositions, propositions, uh, e.g., that, uh, by, on, and it is poor writing uh, to use the same ones all the time. Uh, and by the way, you may do this without even knowing. Uh, every time you say, says that, states that, Right, so you find that in the one paragraph you have the same thing, says that, states that, the second one, the same thing. So the whole thing becomes really monotonous. That's why I want to give you verbs uh, which will allow the writer to indicate the degree to which they support the author uh, of the research. And of course, this could be in terms of claims uh, versus argues, ladies and gentlemen. So let me just... Um, uh, articulate some of this very fast, right? Because I don't intend to uh, take much time on it. You can use a verb like suggests that, right? Let me just give you an example of a statement that brings out that element of suggests, right? Recent studies outlined by Leonard et al. 1999 suggests that personality and disposition play an equally important role in motivation. That's an example you have used suggests. Then you can also use argue that. Leonard Etta, 1999, argue that there are three elements of self-perception. You can also use contend or contends. Mullins, 1994, contends that motivation to work well is usually related to job satisfaction, ladies and gentlemen. So that's another verb that you can use. You can use outline or outlines. Recent studies outlined by Mullins, 1994, suggest that personality and uh, disposition play an equally important role in motivation. You can also use another verb, focus on the early theories of Maslow and McGregor uh, focused on personal needs and wants as the basis for motivation. Another verb is define, uh, in 1987, defines motivation as what is important to you, ladies and gentlemen. 
So the verbs are too many. I don't even know whether I should go ahead and give you more. But let me just add a few. Concludes that reviewing the results of the case study, Taylor 1980 or 1990 or 2017, concludes that the theories of job enrichment and employee motivation do work. Then state is another verb you can use. He further states that there is an increasing importance on the role of autonomy and self-regulation of tasks and increasing motivation. Maintains that Mullins 1984, 99 or 2000, maintains that job enrichment came from Hasberg's two-factor theory, ladies and gentlemen. So those are some of the verbs. We can add another one, found out or found that. Mullins 1994 found that there is an increasing importance on the role played by ABCD or autonomy and self-regulation. <clears throat> we can have another one, promote or promotes. This promotes the idea that tension and stress are important external sources of motivation. Let's take another example of established, right? As established by uh, Sizoma Yell 2000, the more students feel in command of their learning, the more they fulfill their learning potential. All those are verbs, ladies and gentlemen. You have verbs like assert, you have shows, claims, right, reports, mentions, address, right. All those are verbs, and I cannot really <clears throat> go through all of them. Maybe let me just uh, pick it, uh, pick two or three. Uh, but I've given, I've listed all these, <clears throat> given them to you. I've mentioned. Mullins 1994 reports on four content theories of motivation. That is reports. Mentions. Mullins 1994 mentions two common general criticism. Addresses or address. Redesigning jobs so that responsibility moved from supervisors to the workers was an attempt to address the issue or issues of job, satisfac job satisfaction, ladies and gentlemen. So, <clears throat> That is what it is, ladies and gentlemen. So you must have those words that will help you write. But at the end of the day, those constructs that are tied up together uh, through those ideas that you pick from the mind map, right, uh, do provide uh, a critical <coughs> thinking uh, and analysis of your literature review. So you must reference, ladies and gentlemen, and referencing uh, is uh, very important, and that is really evidence. Referencing can be taken as evidence. So you are required to reference your sources as evidence of your academic integrity. Failing to cite your sources, ladies and gentlemen, is plagiarism. And I'll be having another session on plagiarism, ladies and gentlemen. Many people plagiarize without knowing. Remember, I've told you, and with, throughout this workshop, I have mentioned and continue to mention that when you read journal articles, simply pick ideas. And when you pick those ideas, use those ideas to advance your argument. Don't pick sentences, don't pick paragraphs, no. It's only under special circumstances, especially when you want to emphasize a point that will you be allowed to pick a quote. But in this case, you have your own argument that you're advancing in your study. And your argument is not similar to the argument that the other fellow was advancing. Remember, the literature he has constructed certainly is in the direction of his study that is advancing his argument and not your argument. So when you pick a sentence the way it is and you put in your work, you are more or less advancing that fellow's argument and not your argument. So pick ideas and they reference the source of those ideas as evidence. So you use those ideas to advance your own argument, ladies and gentlemen. So failing to cite your sources is plagiarism. So referencing is very important when paraphrasing and summarizing the ideas or works of others and maybe quoting directly from source. But even for a quotation, there is a way that we must reference. And of course, you must follow the instructions provided by your university. Makeda University has its own referencing guidelines. Uganda Christian University has its own. Chambogo University has its own. And likewise, Uganda Matters University has its own. 
So every PhD student is supposed to adopt the referencing style provided by the university. Even journals, by the way, they articulate uh, the uh, referencing style. So let me provide further information uh, when you are writing or constructing your literature. Right? Uh, think about paraphrasing. Don't really pick sentences the way they are. Right? Since you are picking ideas, but once in a while, especially if you find difficulties uh, in writing that text in your own words, you can start by paraphrasing. Then at the end of the day, uh, you, uh, you, you continue to construct your argument. You'll be able to learn. And the only solution to this, ladies and gentlemen, is to practice. Practice and practice and practice. So write and write and write and write and read a lot so that you really uh, familiarize yourself with the terrain. So practice developing your own arguments or ideas without just copying them, right? And uh, that will help you, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> but in case you have difficulties, you can start with the paraphrasing. And a paraphrase is when you write published materials in your own words without changing its original meaning. And it's usually about the same length as the original, as opposed to a summary which is usually much shorter. And it's important that the sentence structure and the vocabulary are not too similar to the original uh, source uh, of that information. And the main way to paraphrase, ladies and gentlemen, is to change the structure of the paragraph, change the words. And it's not enough to do just one of these, ladies and gentlemen. You need to change the structure and the words. You must do this to avoid plagiarism, because plagiarism is an offense and it's a sign of academic dishonesty. Plagiarism is when you copy directly from someone else's work without acknowledging or citing the original author. In other words, you take credit for someone else's work. And in academic writing, ladies and gentlemen, this is the same as cheating on an exam. So it, that is academic dishonesty, ladies and gentlemen. So when you are changing the structure of a paragraph, as I've been saying, you know, I, was, I digressed a little bit just to take you into uh, plagiarism so that you understand it. But when you're changing the structure of a paragraph, in terms of paraphrasing, there are three things you should do to make sure you change the structure of a paragraph. Uh, one, write down only the main ideas and concept. Two, put the original away so that you can't see it, so that you are not really uh, tempted to copy. Three, check your version against the original version, right, to see whether there are some similarities. Write down only the main ideas and concepts. Do not copy slabs of text from your textbook or journal articles. Read the paragraph and write down only the main points or words. Do not write down the entire sentences, ladies and gentlemen. Put the original away so that you can't see it. After you have read your information, put the book, put the journal article away and write down your own your paraphrase from memory. This means that you are not copying out the text word per word, ladies and gentlemen. And in checking your version against the original, many people don't realize they are copying because they don't look back to original text. By checking off what you have written against the original text, you can check that they are not the same as well as checking to see if you have left anything out, ladies and gentlemen. So that is important. But you can also change the words, as I said earlier on, and people's writing styles. And the words they use are very distinct. And it's generally easy to tell when someone has copped uh, straight out of a textbook. Because when I read the student's work, or PhD student's work, right? Um, and I see the language coming through. And of course, failing to get the flow, what we call the consistency of thought, I can actually tell that this was taken from this journal article, this was taken from this book, and so forth, because the whole text does not really cohere 
at the end of the day. So it's generally easy to tell when someone, especially a student, has copped straight out of a textbook because the language changes and the words used are not normally part of the writing sty uh, style of that person or vocabulary for that particular person. And uh, to paraphrase the text, ladies and gentlemen, follow major steps that I will not really highlight uh, in this uh, presentation, ladies and gentlemen. So that is something that I will leave to you uh, so that um, uh, you are able to articulate uh, those things, ladies and gentlemen. So what I'm going to do right now as I move towards closing, how much the closing. As I'm closing, let me talk about the poor, uh, what we call poor writing in a literature review. Right, and that will take us about roughly about three minutes or five minutes. Poor writing in a literature review is often the result of failing to integrate arguments into the review. Read, ladies and gentlemen, journal articles, read books, read theories, etc. After you've done that, pick ideas from those sources. Use those ideas to construct your own arguments. So poor writing in literature review is often the result of failing to integrate arguments into the review. And many people make the mistake of simply summarizing their findings, or their, sorry, not their findings, but their readings, ladies and gentlemen. Do not simply report each, of, each author's theory without any analysis. Right, we want to see the student analysis and integration of the student analysis in the entire write-up. Good writing in a literature review, ladies and gentlemen, right. And uh, what I'm going to do is to give you a summary of what constitutes good writing in a literature review. So that, right, good writing in a literature review, ladies and gentlemen, does a number of things. One, it integrates the research of various authors. So you will see that integration. And that is integration of a, a student's ideas in the way he has put together these arguments. Right, of course, again, it shows similarities and differences of ideas. Right, where you have um, uh, not conflicting in this case, but opposing arguments they'll be brought together. Right, it also shows wide reading. It shows analysis and critical evaluation of what the student has read. I know that some students once in a while, they are actually tempted to copy all the references from the reference section of a particular journey and from a journal and throw that slab in the student's PhD work. And when you look at it, you really see that there was actually no attempt at all to read journal articles, and that what the fellow is trying to present actually is the demonstration of intellectual laziness. Right. As a student, you should never, never entertain intellectual laziness. So if you want to really understand this, again, let me just show an excerpt here on the screen. I'm sure you are seeing that excerpt. And uh, that's an example of analysis of a paragraph. All right. And of course, there uh, from that, I think I'll not read this. Uh, you can see uh, a student shows ability to connect two, uh, two authors' ideas. Then uh, down this way on the extreme right, uh, uh, right hand side here, you will see further reading, right. And then of course, the extreme left, you see the student voice. And then you see down this way, the deeper development of analysis. So this is an example of a good literature review. This paper brings together work in two areas of motivation. Yes, the fellow has actually read. So it's an ability to connect two authors' ideas. Right, according to this and this and that, of course that is evidence, you know that very well. Current thinking, however, does not discount these theories, but simply builds upon them to include the self-concept. This is a student voice. Right, so the fellow has actually read widely. And then, of course, Leonard Bouvard et al. argue that that is a demonstration of further reading, ladies and gentlemen. So I think you can still see that text on the screen, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I want to say that uh, 
Uh, once you do a good job, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, in terms of reading literature, pick those ideas and so forth, and use those particular ideas to construct your literature review, to problematize your literature review, and of course demonstrate a need for further investigation. So ladies and gentlemen, I really want to thank you. You've been a, a very good audience and we've been discussing these things for now quite some time. Uh, but I know that uh, you are really very much committed to attending these workshops. Remember, uh, we are dealing with the major issues of a PhD and uh, many students find difficulties navigating the PhD terrain. Uh, because there are so many unsaid and undocumented rules and procedures. And uh, unless we tell you, for instance, how the literature review should look like, uh, especially if you are uh, doing a PhD where you are not guided, you will tend to copy slabs of information only to be uh, surprised uh, when your supervisor or when you are asked to put your work into the anti-plagiarism software you really discover that um, uh, you have uh, uh, more or less copped about 90% of the contents of other scholars. So again, uh, in a way of summarizing, our workshop eight uh, in our PhD seminar series uh, in business management has dealt with this important topic of navigating the PhD terrain uh, but more so concentrating on literature review. And the structure of our presentation, ladies and gentlemen, in this workshop was uh, in terms of what literature review is, some tips about conducting literature review, writing a literature review, constructing the literature review, problematizing the literature review, and writing your literature review, ladies and gentlemen. So this is just um, an overview. It's actually does, an overview does of what literature review is all about. In subsequent workshops, we shall take considerable time trying to build on these workshop ideas uh, so that we understand this process of literature review very well. So thank you very much. I can only say stay well, stay safe, Bye, ladies and gentlemen.